Hello, everyone. I'm Ben Johnson, and this is the Perpetual Chess Podcast. On Perpetual Chess, I have weekly conversations with the chess world's best players, promoters, and educators about their lives, careers, current projects, and best practices. Perpetual Chess is brought to you through the generosity of its Patreon and PayPal supporters. For more information, go to perpetualchesspod.com. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Perpetual Chess. We have more guests that I am extremely excited for this week. I've wanted to have them on the the program for years, even before they wrote this book that I'm really excited to talk about. Um, I will introduce them one at a time. So we have um, a grandmaster who's twice been the champion of Great Britain. He writes book reviews for New and Chess magazine. Somehow he's also an IT professional. Um... And at the age of 44, somehow also, he's at, at his peak rating. So hopefully we'll get to touch on all of that, but that would be Grandmaster Matthew Sadler. Thanks for joining us, Matthew. A pleasure. Thanks very much. And of course, we have Natasha Regan, the co-author of this book, which I will discuss in a minute. She is a woman international master. She has a mathematics degree from Cambridge. She's also an actuary. Um, not sure if I'm qualified to be interviewing you two, but I'll do my best. Uh, so Natasha, thank you for joining us as well. Thank you. And of course, the occasion for this interview is this incredible book, Game Changer, Alpha Zero's Groundbreaking Chess Strategies and the Promise of AI. I have been, I managed to get my hands on a copy thanks to Forward Chess's app, and I've been tearing through it in anticipation of this interview, although of course I wanted to read it anyway. Um, This is the most anticipated chess book I can remember, really. And it did not disappoint, as I, as I briefly mentioned to you guys. I mean, it's, um, I mean, there's, there's just so much, so much fascinating stuff. I mean, I, I'm interested in the behind-the-scenes stuff, but the the actual chess content is just incredibly groundbreaking. Uh, in the introduction to the book, Gary Kasparov, uh, let me find the quote. He says, uh, "Chess has been shaken to its roots by Alpha Zero," which I think, from a results perspective, is true. But I was glad to see also it's from a from a gameplay perspective, um, from from what we can learn from it. So. Of course, we'll get to that. But I thought that the, the proper thing for us to start with, and I saw that you guys discussed this a little bit with uh, GM Jan Gustafsson and Peter Svidler when, Matthew, you uh, did a quick hit with them um, a few days ago during their broadcast. But, um, and you also talk about it in the book a little bit, but why don't you tell our listeners how this project came about? And whoever wants to go first, go right ahead. Sure. Um, we, Matthew and I had written a book previously, which was called Chess for Life. And uh, that was a book about um, different chess players and how, as they get older, how their um, view of chess changes and how they stay motivated. And we interviewed about 10 top players, um, ages 40, 50, 60 and above, um, about how they still like the game. And uh, we also analyzed their, their chess games. So um, in December 2017, then um, the Alpha Zero paper came out. And Matthew and I happened to be at the London Chess Classic, big London tournament. And uh, we were very excited about this, particularly because uh, that Alpha Zero had actually taught itself how to play chess. And it was the first time a computer had ever been so strong, taught itself how to play chess. Uh, and everyone there was just talking about these games. And um, and Matthew was looking at the games and he was just absolutely fascinated by the style of the games and the attacking nature of the games. And I was thinking, wow, we could do that same sort of idea about a book on Alpha Zero. Um, it would work really well, sort of the, the background interest story, how the computer worked, um, interviews with the people that made it, as well as talking about the chess. Um, we were very lucky that, that we both knew Demis Asabis. He's the CEO of DeepMind, and we'd both knew, known him as a junior chess player. He was a very strong junior chess player. Um, and so we, at the, the dinner to close that London Chess Classic, we approached Demis with our idea, gave him a copy of our, our uh, book, Chess for Life. And he said he wasn't sure whether we'd be able to write a book, but um, he'd take it away, read it, and he'd see. And um, he he read the book, really liked it, and uh, agreed that we could write a book about Alpha Zero. So we're absolutely delighted, and that's that's how it all came about. Well, the chess world is uh, is very fortunate and very grateful that 
both that you guys had this idea and that that Dennis was on board with it. Um, DeepMind, of course, now being a, a subsidiary of uh, of Google, there in London. And I also just, as an aside, wanted to mention that that I'm I'm a fan of uh, Chess for Life. It's um, we talk a lot on this Thank podcast. You. We've got a lot of adult listeners, of course. I mean, most most people listening to podcasts are adults, so we have a lot of hardcore chess fan adults who, of course, are still trying to improve at chess. So, um, in fact, we have a series called Adult Improvers, uh, kind of in the same vein mm-hmm. as what you guys do, where every once in a while I interview someone who's shown a lot of progress. So that book uh, on its own is, um, is, is quite inspiring for a lot of our listeners. But, but of course, we don't want to bury the lead. I mean, Game Changer is, uh, is, is what's in the news and it's what's revolutionizing chess. So, um, so getting back to that, so once you knew that this project, once you had the green light, what was what was the next step? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, go go for it, Natasha. Okay, so uh, next we had um, we were given access to games that hadn't been published. So at the time, there were uh, ten games that had been published, um, and. Um, at the time, people were saying um, that the, the setting. So, so this was in an initial paper, and people were saying the settings that Stockfish used weren't the most optimal ones for Stockfish. Um, so DeepMind wanted to go back and play a new match with the the kind of official settings. So they used settings that were in line with um, the TSEC World Championship. Played a new match, um, and also had a whole lot of games in order to make a peer-reviewed paper. So that's a, a kind of more official and, and peer-reviewed paper that um, that eventually came out in December 2018. Um, so, so we had these games. We couldn't tell anybody about it because uh, everything has to be kept completely confidential when it goes through to a peer review paper. Um, and so Matthew started playing through these games and um, finding themes from Alpha Zero's play. And um, do you want to tell the story about how you um, yeah. how you enjoyed yeah. the games? Yeah, so it was... Um, so, I mean, you know, when I, when I went to, uh, uh, to have a look at the games, first of all, um, uh, I was I had kind of mixed feelings. You know, I mean, um, you're a chess fan, of course, you know, first and foremost. So, uh, I mean, you want everything that's to do with your game. You want it to be wonderful. Um, but on the other hand, you know, I mean, you're used to, you know, to normal engine against engine games. And, you know, I was kind of expecting to see a few interesting games, but, um, you know, nothing, um, nothing consistently, you know, fantastic. I thought there'd be a lot of, uh, of boring games in between them. And, um, you know, I, I played through the first 10 games and I was, you know, thinking, oh, that's quite interesting. That's, that's pretty good. And then there's just, uh, you know, just a, a couple of games that, uh, that came along just in that series. And, uh, um, you know, so I think probably about the eleventh or the twelfth game, and I, I started thinking, "Wow, you know, what's what's going on here?" And then, uh, you know, at one stage, I just burst out laughing. I mean, there I was <laughs> in my little room at uh, a deep mind, you know, and uh, laughing to myself. I hope nobody saw it, but you know, just thought, you know, Alpha Zero is a lunatic, simply. You <laughs> yeah, know, what I mean, um, just giving away these three, four pawns, you know, and just uh, going, you know, huge on the initiative, and um, and you know, I mean, that that makes a tremendous, you know, tremendous. Uh, I don't know, it has a big emotional impact on you actually and uh and then after you know, after about 20 25 games i thought you know wait stop wait a minute you know i'm i'm already i'm you know i'm seeing patterns i'm, I'm recognizing things that alpha zero seems to do consistently you know and then I, I went back and i started making databases you know uh, as i was working of uh, all this theme rook's pawn advance uh, he seems to be targeting the king and all that and uh, you know obviously we, we refined that an awful lot later but um uh, but yeah i mean straight away from the word go i mean you, you can just pick things out you know huge big themes you know that um uh that, that, that were really striking and i think you know that sort of emotion and that sort of uh, feeling of wow but these things just jump out at you um from the chess point of view you know that's why we really thought we could write you know a really nice book you know just a and a book that people could learn from as well because you know if the theme struck me with such force and uh and if you know if i felt they were so so easy to pull out then uh, you know we were sure we could explain them to uh, you know to a very broad audience you know and uh uh, and um yeah and i mean it, it only got better basically you know the more games you played through the more the more fantastic it got and uh, you know i mean in in all those 210 games the 210 games that were released um i mean you know there's just so many wonderful wonderful games 
Yeah, it's incredible. And you guys do do a really good job, like uh, highlighting the themes, because I, I, I'm sure that, you know, um, they're easier for, for players of, of your strength to to pick up on than, than someone else might be able might have more trouble tying them together. And it's nice that you have the little historical comparisons uh, to different players. And I know that you guys uh, mentioned this in your book, but for listeners who haven't haven't gotten to the book yet, and hopefully listeners, you guys, you guys all sh- all should buy this. Um, Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> um, who what players would you compare? Uh, would you compare Alpha Zero to what players in history? I think there's a there's a, a few that we we like to compare Alpha Zero to. Um, one of them's Kasparov, um, and his his kind of really attacking games, and and so the way Alpha Zero goes very directly out for the attack reminds us of Kasparov. Um, another one is um, is Magnus Carlsen as well, um, and the way Alpha Zero kind of can understand a position. And um, and make a lot of a, of a small edge and uh, make its pieces go on on kind of just feeling where are the good squares for its pieces. And um, we've got comparisons throughout. So other players are Anand and Karpov. Um, uh, Botvinnik. Botvinnik, yeah. 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 Botvinnik's a uh, yeah. Botvinnik's a really nice one actually. Uh, um, I mean, I, I got. Um, um, actually, funnily enough, you know, studying Alpha Zero's games, I got really into Botvinnik uh, um, again because uh, I really felt that the way that he built up his position as white, you know, often uh, playing these systems where you fix the center in order to play on the wings. Um, this was very, very typical of, uh, of Alpha Zero's play with um, play with white. And uh, it's quite nice, uh, uh, you know, uh, as, as well that because, uh, well, Bob Vinnick, you know, in the 1960s, he was busy trying to build um, a computer that could teach itself. I right. mean, that was his that was his great goal. And then, you know, you look at the, his games and the way he built up his games. We we quote a few in the in, in the book. And, uh, you know, you really are struck by, uh, you know, this, this approach that uh, that really mirrors Alpha Zero's in uh, in a number of games. And um, and yeah, I mean, it's nice that you mentioned the the historical perspective because um, that was the thing that was striking us all the time. Um, that you know, there's there's some element that that Alpha Zero is um, you know rediscovering what uh, what humans have discovered. And uh, you know, when you're playing through its games, it you know all these little lights go off in your head of oh wait a minute that reminds me of that or this or that. And then at the same time, of course, there's all the new stuff and the you know the enormous energy and drive and. Uh, uh, with which you know, Alpha Zero implements a lot of these plans as well. So uh, it's a it's a mixture of um, recognition and discovery. Yeah, it really is. And Natasha, you told a funny story in the book. Maybe you could tell it for our audience of uh, of you trying to implement some of some of the things uh, some of the things yeah, that Alpha was, Zero taught. It w- it was it was great fun actually uh, trying out some of these themes in my games, and um, I was I was playing these games without being able to tell anyone that I was working on Alpha Zero at all. And, um, and of course, as we were putting the chapters together, we were doing them really one by one. And so at the start, uh, one of the first chapters we did was the chapter on the H-pawn. And the, uh, the way Alpha Zero pushes its H-pawn right up, so for white, right up to H6, puts it close to the opponent's king. Um, and actually, by the stage I'd been looking at, at just that chapter, I thought I'd still try it out in my games. And, um, and and actually, it was, I did get some really fun games like that. Um, but I didn't manage to quite do it with the whole rest of the strategy about keeping the center closed and good mobility pieces and whatever. So I played this H-Pawn very enthusiastically. Uh, but it didn't always work. And um, and at the end of the game, my opponent was, would say, oh, you played your H-Pawn too early there. Right. Um, it's weakening your king. And you're like, I really want to tell you why I played that H-Pawn. <laughs> right. Yeah, that's great. Shout out to uh, Harry the H Pawn and Simon Williams. Alpha, yeah, Zero, Alpha yeah. Zero is a huge fan. Uh, it's it's really uh, it's shocking to see. It actually, yeah. it, it, it actually it um it is amazing sometimes when you get to positions. I've had it in quite a few games recently where you get to a position and you're not quite sure what to do next, and then suddenly you remember about this H Pawn, and actually it turns out to be a really good move you hadn't thought of. It's it is amazing. Yeah, it really leaves an imprint in the brain. I was also I was looking at a game earlier today, and just the pawn was on g six, so there's a hook. So my the first thing I'm looking at is throwing the h pawn up the board, and it's you know the book is uh 
it's so detailed that it's the kind of book where I read it once and I just feel like I need to read it again right away. Um, <laughs> I mean, how much? So you guys both work full time. Um, how ha- how have you managed to uh, to turn this out? Like, how have you managed to find the time to do it? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, looking back, I think we both wonder that too. You know, um, <laughs> it's. Um, but I mean, I, I think it's. Uh, you know, it was. I think that this was our project. You know, this was something that we really wanted to do. And when you've got that sort of, uh, you know, that sort of passion for uh, for something, um, you know, and uh, somehow the time just you seem to put in the time and, and you don't really mind. But uh, but looking back on it, I think we must have spent, you know, all our spare time in the evenings and all our weekends for uh, yeah for for a very long period of time, six seven months. You know, just on Alpha Zero games. And uh, and putting this together and thinking about it and uh, and all of that. So, yeah, it's been um it's been a you know a, a, um, a big effort you know. And uh, I suppose you know when you, you always have that little feeling when you look back and you think, oh well, you know, um, I, re- I remember now how much work it is. I'll never do that again, you know. But uh, but then you find another project that fascinates you and uh, and you're off again, you know. But uh, but I mean, it was an incredibly stimulating and exciting project to do, you know, with, uh, and, uh, you know, talking to all sorts of, you know, talented engineers and super bright people with great ideas, you know, it's, um, yeah, I mean, it, it was, it was a great project. Yeah. yeah you, sorry, go ahead, Natasha. <laughs> yeah, really exciting project. And, um, <clears throat> actually work were really good because they did let me have a little bit of extra time off as well. I said, I'm not doing this uh, project, writing a book. And, and, um, so they were very supportive. Um, but it was it was uh, like you'd rush home and and you'd 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 want to get back to me and working on the book and um, and making improvements and um, yeah it was just a really fun time. Yeah, and Matthew mentioned you mentioned earlier uh, going into a little room to actually see Alpha Zero, and of course your your videos analyzing the the Carlson Caruana match uh, with Alpha Zero kind of kind of went viral. They made quite a splash in the chess world. So, could you uh, lift the curtain a little more? Like, what was your access to the actual computer like? What was the nature of that? Well, um, there were two different things actually that we uh, that we did. So, um, um, first of all. Um, you know, we we got all the um, all the games and started analysing them. And um, well, we could just uh, we had uh, you know a couple of the technicians were uh, were at our disposal, um, and we could just ask them to provide complete trees of analysis from Alpha Zero from certain positions. So um, uh, you know that that and that's absolutely fantastic. You know, you have the evaluation, the main lines, all the lines it's considered, and you just get this beautiful overall view of what Alpha Zero thought of the position. And you know, sometimes you've got a tree, and then you said, oh. Um, the move I was thinking of wasn't in there, so could you send me another one? And uh, I got masses and masses of those uh, of those trees. So I mean that was uh, that was fantastic. Um, and then during the World Championship, uh, they um, just because um, obviously you know things were sort of happening uh, real time, so uh, it wasn't really convenient just to keep on producing those trees like that. Um, they sort of gave us um, um, yeah online access is a bit like having uh, you know a chess engine in chess space you know simply that uh, that we you know whilst um, uh, magnus and uh, and fabiana were playing we just had um, um, we were just saw the main line that uh, alpha zero was considering with a um, with an evaluation okay you know, and, uh, and that was uh, and that was during the during the world championship it's um, i mean i love the trees to be honest that that really appealed yeah, to me yeah and, and there's some of that in the but, book uh, yeah you guys go uh, yeah. Very detailed explanations. Um, it, it's it's interesting to see. So, have you guys been in the same room as Alpha Zero? Have you uh, have you seen the machine itself? No, that's some, somewhere somewhere else in a, in a data center somewhere. You that's, know, so uh, <laughs> yeah, we've so, seen, uh, seen it on the screen. Yeah, yeah. So we've seen the the output from it okay from that's funny because it's so like of course it was even more shrouded in mystery before this book but there's still that that element still remains yeah i mean it's it's a computer and it lives in a data center and yeah. uh, you know you access it through uh through uh you know through a client and uh through a, through a program and it, and it shows you the output you know it's uh i mean yeah it would, would be uh um, I mean, I, I'm an IT guy, you know, so, uh, yeah, people always, you know, like the idea of going to the data center and seeing lights flashing, but, uh, but actually you don't see that much, really. It's the, it's the output that's, uh, that's, uh, that's the important thing. Okay. During, during the World Championships, we did um, show one or two journalists the, the screen with Alpha Zero on. Um, but it was, to be honest, it looks like, like it's, it's, it does look like um, if you had uh, Stockfish or one of the other engines there, so it's, okay. it shows its line and 
Yeah. yeah. And you guys mentioned uh, the need to keep this project a secret, speaking of showing journalists. So how hard was that to, to, to walk around with this secret for, for seven months or, or however long it was exactly? Well, there were, there were lots of things we were very excited about. And, and of course, um, people like, like, say, on our chess teams, then people were talking about Alpha Zero all the time and, um, and, and coming up with ideas. And, and so it was quite hard to, to not say anything about it. Yeah, yeah it's, uh, I mean, the, the worst thing was, you know, spending your whole weekend doing stuff and then your colleagues ask you, so what have you been doing? And you right. say, oh, nothing much, you know, so uh, that was just uh, that was a bit uh, a bit a little bit uh, a little bit sad, you know, but uh, but yeah, I mean, um, um, you know, the, the this the scientific paper that uh, that DeepMind was releasing in, you know, in 2018, December, that was just super important for them, you know, and uh, yeah. and, you know, for that confidentiality is is, is important, you know, so uh, so, you know, of course, we uh, we uh, we did our best to uh, to 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 work with that. Yeah, it was you, quite nice having two of us working on it because then we could at least talk to each other. Yeah, exactly. yeah that's a good point. Yeah, and then the 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 build up from when it, when your project was announced, or at least to like uh, when I found out about it, to it being released was was pretty quick. It seemed like uh, you know I I feel like I heard about it like you say probably in December, and then all of a sudden at first uh, there was a March. The book was going to come out in March, and then it was coming out, and here we are in January. And by the way, uh, listeners, as I said, it's available on Forward Chess and available on New and Chess's site. I'm not sure if Amazon in the U.S. has it yet, but um, but you can you can get it now for sure. So, but yeah, I'm glad that you guys were able to to get it out there so quickly. Yeah, we were we were sort of trying to get it out as as quickly as we could after the paper had been released. So um, so that was our, our sort of. On your marks, get set, go. Yeah. Um, okay, well, let's get a little more into its chess play. Um, some of this we've already answered, but I do want to ask the question of a supporter of the podcast um, because uh, I, I give the opportunity for for people who support the show to send in questions to listeners. And here we have the, the mysterious Moonmaster 9000. This is one of our more mysterious uh, supporters. But uh, um, his, some of these... some. Some of his question we've answered, but we'll just let you guys tackle it. Uh, he says, early on, most chess players are taught that pieces have a, have a numeric value, which leads many players to play very rigidly and mathematically. Was Alpha Zero taught the numeric value of the pieces, he asked, because he sees the way it sacrifices for positional gain and has doubts that humans have assigned value to the pieces of Alpha, like programmed at Alpha Zero. Yeah, so Alpha Zero wasn't taught any human knowledge like the value of pieces at all. So it was taught the rules and it knows, you know, when it's checkmate or, or when the game's over and who's won. Uh, but it, it wasn't taught anything like a pawn's one and a knight's three or anything like that. So it had a freedom to be able to assess that kind of thing for itself. But it feels like maybe, it, you know, it's hard to know whether it puts a value on the pieces, um, but it does look at its chance of winning the game or drawing the game from any given position. So it feels like there are some points where the material is less important than, for example, having an open line or having uh, really good attacking potential or good mobility for its pieces. Um, so, so we're kind of thinking it, it probably doesn't assign values in exactly the same way that, that we might or, um, and, and, and that might, and as the questioner says, it, it does kind of anchor us as humans to thinking of this value of pieces, and it, it probably does make it harder for us to um, to sacrifice pieces like that. Yeah, and you guys lay out uh, sort of four precepts of uh, how Alpha Zero works in the book: uh, learning rather than being programmed, general rather than specific, yeah. grounded rather than logic based, and active rather than passive. Which the fourth one is is very striking when you when you see the games. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's incredible to see. And one other topic I definitely want to get to is, of course, Alpha Zero's openings. Um, I mean, that's something that was was fascinating to see because here it is figuring out chess on its own. So, um, Matthew, could you could you tell us a little bit about some of the discoveries that that you uncover in studying the openings that Alpha Zero chose? Yeah, I mean, it's. Um, I mean, the first thing that uh, that everyone notices is that um, you know, from with the white pieces, Alpha Zero. Um, likes either one knight f3 or, or one d4, you know, and uh, and uh, rather than one e4. I mean, the difference is not huge. I mean, uh, it's just you know, it prefers it by a, a percentage point or or something. But uh, it does prefer d4 knight f3, and I think this reflects very well 
um, actually, you know, current, the current feeling at the world top um, and also the flexibility that it gives because, you know, with one knight F3, you can transpose into D4. So um, that, that's really a, a lovely, flexible thing. And having options, having choice is something that, uh, you know, Alpha Zero seems to like very, very much. Um, I mean, and what you see is that, you know, Alpha Zero's openings, they're essentially they're very classical and um, they're really you know um, aimed at, at, at good solid rapid development um, I mean it plays uh, you know d4 c4 knight f3 and then against the Queen's Indian for example there's this 4g3 system that it plays uh, very very well um, it also um, uh, but whenever um, whenever there's a, um, a chance to um, I, I don't know increase the tempo then um, it's never seems to afraid to be to, to do it so for example you know it plays the Botvinnik system against the semi-slav with uh, with great pleasure and uh, and also um, you know the anti-Moscow gambit so semi-slav is d4 d5 c4 c6 knight f3 knight f6 knight c3 e6 and it just goes right in there with bishop g5 d takes c4 e4 is the botvinnik system and h6 bishop h4 d takes c4 e4 is the uh, is the anti-moscow gambit and uh, you know it plays these with um, with great panache actually so uh, and that's the nice thing about alpha zero you know it builds up its position but as soon as it thinks oh i've got a chance now to accelerate and really get into uh, into the opponent's position then it takes it and um, if you look at the spread of openings they play certainly as white i mean it's uh, it's a really great repertoire you know it's really a repertoire that you'd say uh, this is a real world class repertoire that i think people should copy and then with black um yeah i mean one e4 one e5 is its uh, favorite opening you know very classical and uh, it ends up playing the berlin defense as well uh, in in the rye lopez so uh, looks like kramnik was right yeah all along no surprise um, there and, uh, yeah actually i mean you know when, when you think uh, there's one thing about the berlin that's always puzzled me is that you know it was first played around 1896 by uh, by pillsbury and then afterwards tarash played uh, a few games as well and did uh, emmanuel lasker played a game uh, as well did extremely well you know and uh, you always think I, I wonder why they didn't you know persevere with that opening because uh, they had great results against strong players you know but somehow we had to wait you know 100 years before uh, before kramnik came back with it um and then um against 1d4 it um yeah it tends to play some sort of nimzo indian or the ragazin actually if uh, if white goes uh, d4 knight f6 c4 e6 knight f3 tends to play uh, d5 knight c3 and bishop b4 or bishop e7 um it's got quite a few openings uh, against 1d4 that it seems to consider to be the same um, i mean to be honest that the most fascinating thing about it is when you force alpha zero to play um well openings it considers less sound uh, because it it plays those pretty well as well i mean in the book we've got a couple of uh, well, we've got a fantastic uh, king's indian samish um variation you know which is uh, real kasparov style uh, with black i have to say and um and there's, you know we also did a video on uh, on a really great uh, leningrad dutch game you know so um uh, it's um i mean it really is a, 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 a such an attack active attacking player you really think oh you should maybe get it to play uh, you know some of these more aggressive openings uh, sooner but in terms of what it would like to play itself it it always goes for these uh, very classical very solid openings where it develops its pieces gets its king to safety very important for alpha zero and then starts looking around to uh, you know to start uh, encroaching and with with white it finds yeah an incredible a number of ways of injecting you know these um this um attacking impetus into a lot of quiet openings i mean uh, i've never seen so many pushes of the h pawn in in g3 queen's indians as in alpha zero's games you know it's uh but it's it's a it's a, it's a very very good solid you'd actually say well thought out repertory you know uh, with uh, with both white and black yeah, and the statistics that you guys share about like how often it throws the H pawn up the board and about like the the ways that it constricts the the enemy's king so that it's not just sort of anecdotal there there's actual stats about the sort of uh qualitative differences in the way that it's approaching chess. It's it's super interesting. So, I mean, as a as a strong player, I mean, you mentioned you guys talk a little bit in the book about how this is of course likely to filter through to how how people play chess both like, you know, club level players um, and of course other professionals. So, have you guys been having any uh, in your travels, uh, you know, stopping by um, Weekend Z and stuff like that? Have you had professionals pull you aside and ask for for um, like advance advice sort of stuff? 
Yeah, I mean, we've had a, we've had a few we had a few uh, you know little conversations, but um, I mean I think it's all it's all still all quite new now. You know I think uh, probably once the, the the book comes out, then uh, more and more people will get uh, will get into it. I think um, um, you know I mean you know, two hundred and ten games were released, and I think that's that's a hell of a lot of games actually. And uh, I think it's um, it can be a little bit overwhelming for uh, for people you know to to find their way amongst the games. And uh, I think what uh, what we're hoping that our book does is just uh, put you know just uh, take that body of games and just show everyone. But wait a minute, it, it's actually you know really clear and easy and simple. This is what Alpha Zero does. You know these general themes in all sorts of different positions. And I think we. With those themes to guide you suddenly you know the whole thing makes sense so um uh, yeah i mean we're really hoping that uh, well that uh, well i mean we, we'd love it i mean uh, you know if, uh, if people keep on coming to us and talking to us about alpha zero yeah and i think they will be i saw that magnus carlson said that he he went through the book on his rest day um in, yeah in we can see yeah. so he and described I, it as quite inspirational, so that was lovely. Yeah, that that was great, and I know that uh, the the Mag- Magnus's team, Peter Hein Nielsen, and uh, Jan Gustafsson, and uh, Lawrence Fresnay, when they did the videos they did for Chess Twenty Four, little behind the scenes stuff, they were always referencing Alpha Zero whenever they had a chance as well in terms of uh, what it said about a, um, a you know a given position uh, as yep. they they go through the match. So yeah, it'll be really interesting. I'm a little worried that the Berlin's going to become even more popular, but but what can you do? <laughs> One of the things I'd say relating to this is um, about the the themes and the the strategies that um, you might not have heard them before, but then when you do, they they become quite easy to understand. So the one I was thinking about today was um, a recurring theme is is about exchanging off the the very active pieces of the opponent. So when Alpha Zero gets a plus, it doesn't necessarily sort of continue trying to blast through with an attack. It can just take that it's it's better there and exchange off the active pieces, leave the opponent with the passive pieces, and and then just win it that way. So much more quietly, it looks like it's going to be. Um, a huge attacking game all the way through it attacks for somewhat and then does just this sort of quiet exchanging and and you can imagine incorporating that into your own game quite easily and um and 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 that it just would work yeah it's very patient <laughs> mm. yeah so, i mean the, the the best example of what natasha's describing is um is a game we called actually we gave all the game names you know we were quite inspired by uh, by bobby fisher's 60 memorable games and uh, um, the one the, the real Great example of, of what Natasha's referring to is uh, a game called Python Squeeze, where um, Alpha Zero builds up this massive attack on the king side, and uh, Stockfish reshuffles its pieces and has a, a king on g8 and a rook on h8 because it looks like Alpha Zero is right, going to open yeah. the h file. And then afterwards, Alpha Zero just uh, exchanges off um, all the, uh, the uh, all Stockfish's pieces on the queen side, leaves it with a rook on h8, and then just invades on the queen side. You know, it's, uh, and just leaves it there basically. You know, it's a wonderful strategy, really wonderful full uh, strategy great great fun to watch yeah that game was incredible and and listeners um as a I, I, i'm a podcast fan myself so sometimes i uh i listen you know i'll listen to an author talking about a book on a podcast and then feel like i i don't need to buy the book that's uh clearly not the case with this one you, you guys have to see these games um so do you have a sense of uh, uh if any more games will be released or i know what alpha zero's uh future plans are yeah, we don't. Um, I mean, we're not deep mind employees, so you know, those are sort of things that um, you know that, that we hear. You know, just uh, when when uh, when deep mind you know sort of uh, thinks has an idea of what it wants to do. I mean, um, uh, I mean, the thing about deep mind is that they've always got you know loads and loads of projects and new stuff coming along. I mean, I don't know whether you saw last. Thursday was it? It seems years ago, but I think it was last Thursday, and uh, there was this huge thing about StarCraft Two, you know, and right, uh, yeah, and, and this huge demonstration, and uh, you know, I mean, there's always things things going along. I mean, I think at the end of the day, you know, the chess is is it's a science project for um for uh, for, for for Deep Mind, and they you know they've got their goal of where they want to be, having this general purpose algorithm that can tackle any sort of problems, you know. Um, uh, and you know, if if they think that um, that chess, you know, could still help, 
then uh, then they'll have a look at chess and uh, if they think oh well it's time to go on to other things and uh, that'll help us better to achieve their goal and then they'll do that you know but uh, I mean the one nice thing is that you know Demis Sasabis is uh, you know he's a chess player when he was young and he's a big chess fan so uh, you know that's always uh, that's always something you know but um, but yeah I mean we'll have to we'll have to see you know we'll have to see what the uh, what the future brings but um, I mean for, for the moment you know with the with the games that have been released and all that I mean there's a there's a real treasure trove to explore so uh, I think we still got uh, still got loads to do with uh, with what's been released already you know before we start uh, we start running out of ideas yeah we sure do I know in the in the conclusion you say my conception and understanding of chess has been altered and immeasurably enriched by this process and we're, yeah we're, and we're talking about a top 50 player here so that that's uh that's that's something um so do you guys have time to talk about uh chess for life a little bit oh yeah always okay because yeah it's um as i said it's uh it's of 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 great interest to our listeners so um so chess for life was written for a couple years ago in which they interview uh adult players who are still still competing um from the you know I would say from the 2000 level on up, the actual players. I mean, of course, and going back and looking at some some historical examples like Capablanca as well. Um, so if you were to, to distill it into actionable advice for, for people with a limited amount of time who are really, really trying to, um, to, to reach new heights in chess, what, what can they do? There was, there was um, one really lovely interview in the book um, with a guy called Terry Chapman. Um, and he had been a, a company CEO. So he had been played chess as a kid. He gave up um, and then took it up again. And he took a, a very logical and thought out approach to how he would improve. And, um, and he came up with some lovely advice. So one piece of advice, which was really nice, was um, if you're playing through games, um, say so, so you pick up games from chess base or something, then play through a game of a very strong player against a player who's quite a bit weaker. Because if, if you look at games with two players of the same strength, then um, sometimes the, the, the real strategy, you, you can't, it's a bit obscured because the other player can defend against it and, um, and, and so you can't quite see what's going on. But if you look at the players where there's a difference in strength, then um, the, the strong player will, will kind of get the strategy that, that they want to get. Um, and, and so you can see much clearly the strategic pattern of the game. So I thought that was really nice, because particularly if you're studying a particular opening, something like that, then you can look at the top games and then, and then this one where there's a rating difference. Um, another, a, a different player, Keith Arkell, he always liked to watch um, rapid play games. And it was actually for a similar type of reason in that people can't calculate all the tactics so fast. So again, they tend to, they can be quite strategic games and you can see that happening at speed um, over the board. Um, another thing several of the players uh, thought was to play at places where you enjoy going to that place. So when you're a kid, you will play anywhere as long as you get some competitive chess. Um, when you're uh, mature players, they, they want to play somewhere where they're going to be happy in the surroundings, nice space, nice place they want to go to. And, and that did seem to be a theme of, of quite a lot of the players, even the ones who are still professional. Can you think of some more, Matthew? Um, yeah, I mean, the um, uh, talking about the Terry Chapman thing about you know looking at um, strong players against weak players. What Terry also said was that um, um, he always wanted to. So he was around uh, you know twenty two hundred, twenty two fifty, and he always thought you know well obviously players rated around twenty three hundred are going to cause me problems. But it's so great if he then gets you know Gelfand playing uh, players that rated twenty three hundred, Michael Adams playing. Um, players rated 2300 and he can see those players getting beaten and that gives him a great deal of confidence in order to uh, to play them afterwards um, so it was uh, and there's a lot of people who had tricks like that I mean uh, Ingrid Lauterbach the uh, the German women's international she said uh, always she uh, she plays through uh, through games um, uh, of her opponent that uh, they've lost you know she always plays through those just before she uh, she starts the game to give herself confidence um, but I think the, the the big thing about it really really was you know it's the last point that Natasha made was finding ways to have enjoyment um the British grandmaster Keith Arkell said that uh, yeah you should really prepare as uh, as little as possible before the game 
It's all about feeling fresh as you get older and uh, and being in a good mood and uh, and enjoying the surroundings. Um, and we also talked to um, uh, we, we looked a lot at, um, at how people prepare their opening repertory. And we gave quite a few practical tips and suggested repertories, actually, for repertoires that will last your whole life. And um, we looked at players like um, Sergei Tivyakov, who um, uh, is not really a senior player, is a, but he's you know sort of my age, really. So, uh, well, maybe I am. A senior player too actually but uh, um but he's actually played the same variation of the scandinavian so e4 d5 e takes d5 queen takes d5 knight c3 queen d6 played it non-stop for uh, you know 12 or 13 years with astonishingly good results and we had a look at you know how did he do that and uh, you saw how clever he was at switching move orders at um uh, at playing typical positions that the computer assessed at uh, you know at minus 0.7 but then winning those you know uh, natasha just pulled out some great statistics where essentially um in about you know three quarters of the game the computer assessed uh, sergey's position after after move uh, 10 or 11 at uh, my you know at 0.7 for white you know which is a big advantage and yet he won a huge amount of those games so you know playing openings that you know very well is seems to be you know a very good thing to do to uh, to have long lasting openings and then we also yeah. looked at yeah, yeah. Pierre Kramling's openings as well which were very very nice and how she throughout the course of her career how she switched openings recycled them and uh, essentially was playing the same openings for uh, for 30 years but still keeping them nice and fresh so uh, a lot of practical tips in there as well for building up your opening repertory and if you think across the two books we also in each book had a chapter on the Carlsbad pawn structure yeah yeah and um and it's it's really funny they're just completely different strategies so one was based on english grandmaster keith arkle and he's been playing this pawn structure uh for 30 years 40 years or more playing it an awful long time and he really knows it inside out um your readers will be familiar with the pawn structure, I think, but it's it's where you've gone kind of C takes D5, E takes D5. So white has a kingside pawn majority, five pawns um, sort of on the D to H file, and then the A and B pawns. And black has just the four pawns um, and the um, A, B, C, D pawns, and so not an E. And, uh, and white traditionally plays a minority attack in this position. And there's lots of... Um, there's, there's a whole strategy that Keith played involving minority attack, getting your knight round to d3 where it can um, control a weak f2 pawn and jump into f4 um, and swapping off queens at the right time as well and, and getting a, a favourable ending for white. So that's how Keith plays it. And then when we uh, leap forward to Game Changer, then we looked at how Alpha Zero played it. And Alpha Zero played it in a completely different way. It was really fascinating. And Alpha Zero didn't tend to use the minority attack at all and instead just went straight for the uh, kingside attack. Of course. <laughs> yeah, um, no, I, I, yeah. I mean, the really great uh, Carlsbad game, actually, is, um, it got a, a special chapter on there. It's a, a game with black where, um, I mean... In, in general, you know, if, if white's attacking on the queen side, you'd expect black to attack on the king side. But in practice, that never seems to happen very much. But uh, but actually, that this uh, the game in the Carlsbad chapter. It's one of the um, it's one of the yeah one of one of the one of the best ever actually games I've ever seen. And uh, actually, it's not one of the games in the original two ten. So it's uh, one of the games that um, that uh, that well only we had seen before uh, before it's been before it's been published in the book. Okay, yeah, and and speaking of the Carlsbad chapter in Game Changer, Matthew, you mentioned in it that um, you had the most instructive five minutes of your life with Dvoretsky uh, discussing the Carlsbad, so obviously uh, our, our listeners would like to hear a bit more about that, I would imagine. Yeah, yeah, it's an amazing experience, actually, because, um, um, I mean, actually, I haven't had very much coaching at all, uh, relatively speaking, during my life. You know, I, I had my last regular trainer when I was um, probably just 14, and then afterwards I ended up uh, doing it by myself. But um, but um, a friend of mine, Steve Giddings, was working in um, uh, in Moscow, and uh, he uh, he loves chess, and uh, he was, he, he'd got into, uh, you know, the, the, the Moscow chess scene, and he said, you know, I've, uh, I've, I know a guy who knows Doretsky. You know, w- would you like to do some training with him? It, you know, I, I could uh, try and try and do that. And um, yeah, of course, you know, fantastic. And um, I ended up uh, having two sessions of, of a week with uh, with Doretsky. And uh, I mean, he's a fantastic guy. I mean, when you think 
um, that he'd worked with, you know, absolutely all the top players, every single one, you know, and um, and there I was, you know, an English guy. I was a GM, you know, 25, uh, 50 or 60 or something, but nothing special, you know, and yet the effort that he gave and, you know, the, the dedication and the encouragement was uh, it was amazing. I mean, he was, uh, I think, even more actually than, you know, than any technical stuff I learned from him, which was, you know, fantastic as well. It That 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 empathy and that enthusiasm was just the you know the most amazing thing you know it's a real a real fantastic human being um but anyway yeah i mean um we got to this carlsbad structure and he said so what do you know about that and um well i mean as always you know i, I have this thing about you know never quite admitting i know nothing really and uh, <laughs> you know, i tried to look convincing but i didn't look very convincing and so he just said okay i'll explain and just in you know in five minutes you know you just got this this total overview of the structure. You know, what are the plans for white? Okay, B4, B5, the minority attack, but how can black stop it? And, uh, you know, he can play A6 to uh, A6 and B5 to, to block the queen side structure. He can go A5 and then white plays a3 and b4 and then you leave it or you take it um or you meet b when white pet pushes b5 you go c5 um you know it's just a, an amazing uh, range of um of uh, of plans and everything and it just um i think that was um i, I i've used this uh, you know this, this way of thinking now for for a lot of other openings you know where um wait we, we i just realized you know how completely you could understand the position and capture all the plans and how amazingly useful that knowledge was and uh, well, I mean, I wrote a book, that was back in 1998, I think, 99, yeah, on the Queen's Gambit declined, and, uh, you know, that's the real centrepiece of the book, and actually, that's always the bit that people mention, they always say, uh, you know, oh, that was a fantastic chapter, but it was, you know, it wasn't mine, right. <laughs> it was Doretzky, uh, I do mention that in the book, but, uh, yeah, you know, I mean, that was, that was, uh, you know, that was really, really fantastic, um, you know, and it really, uh, um, but it was, uh, you know, it was an amazing, uh, an amazing experience, I mean, I remember the first, the, the, the very first time that it started, um, he always gives his students uh, a test, you know, about um, 10 or 15 positions. And um, you've got a very limited time to do the, the puzzles, about 30 seconds. He just wanted to test your intuition um, and uh, and just see, um, you know, what move you want to play in this position. And some of them are tactical and some of them are positional. But um, so I think this one I had one minute for, and, uh, you know, I sort of uh, um, uh, looked at it, you know, trying to find, trying to find, and tr did something on the king side or something. And he said, uh, Kranik uh, solved this in five seconds. Oh, God. <laughs> when he was 12. Right, of course. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, that sort of, um, that sort of set the tone, really, you know, and, uh, I, you know, I sort of, I sort of understood, you know, from that first moment. Okay, this is going to be, uh, this is going to be hard work. And um, I mean, I've never, I've never worked as hard as I did in those, uh, in those two weeks. You know, he'd set you uh, these amazingly complex, um, uh, complex uh, puzzles, and I'd be, you know, I'd be working all night uh, at them. Wow. But, um, but there was one, uh, there's one thing that I'm super proud of, and um, it's uh, in one of his books. Um, he gives a, another set of 10 exercises which uh, which he gave to me as well and uh, I didn't do badly on them but there was one position where uh, I found a, a plan that was uh, that nobody else had found you know and uh, and uh, um, because um, actually you were attacking on the queen side, but well, in those days I was a complete hacker and I found some amazing little idea to transfer all my pieces to the king side and start attacking. And, uh, you know, it was um, and he mentions me in the book, said uh, Sadler found this plan. You know, it was really uh, it was really excellent. Uh, that was that's probably my, my proudest moment of my life. I have to say. <laughs> Well, you, you've got some other achievements up there, too, but that that's a great story. Thank you for sharing that. And I, I just have one or two questions, uh, uh, more questions, if you guys are okay with it. Yeah, uh, no problem. Okay, I'll go fast. Um, num number one is uh, listeners always like to hear um, – well, actually um, – just trying to decide on an order um yeah we'll leave, we'll finish with chess books i first i just want to ask matthew so we've been talking about uh chess for life and about adult improvement but as i mentioned in the introduction uh you're basically at your peak rating and that's pretty rare uh for i mean with all due respect i mean i, I think you're you're 44 so yeah. uh and you're working full time so you and yourself i mean i'm sure writing that book uh didn't hurt but what what sort of uh tricks have you developed to to play at an elite level uh while um not having as much time as most of your competitors to work on chess um i think the, the most important thing that i discovered actually um was that 
it's very important to do a little bit of chess every day. So um, um, when I when I first uh, started playing again, you know, back in in 2010, after quite a long break from chess, about nine years, I think. Um, I um, uh, oh, what often happened was, you know, I, I played a tournament at the weekend, and then I didn't look at anything uh, during the week, and then. You know, maybe I'd, I'd had a couple of weeks where I didn't play, and I played again, and it felt like I'd been away for months. And um, I, you know, I realised that you know, big difference between a professional and an amateur is that a professional's always thinking about chess. I mean, even if you're doing other stuff, you know, the shopping or whatever, there's always moves ticking in the background, and uh, you know, and suddenly, whilst you're doing the shopping, you think, oh my goodness, knight b5, refuse what I've been looking at. Right. And you don't have that as an amateur because yeah you've got your job and you know there's so many other other other, other calls on your on your time so um, you know I just made the rule that you know 15 minutes every day on chess that was uh, make sure all those um, you know all those uh, paths and patterns in your brain are, are kept active and that helped enormously um, the other thing that I always tell people but nobody is impressed at all and uh, and nobody likes the idea is that I play you know daily training games against um against stockfish actually on my uh, on my mobile phone yeah and, I saw um, you, you've written about that yeah yeah i mean it's it's such a good training i mean as long as you you know you, you understand that you uh that, you, that you're going to lose you know i mean you've got to you've got to not mind losing at all you know but uh but if you just accept that and then every game you just go in with the same attitude saying now finally i'm going to show stockfish that i can uh, that i can do this then I mean you learn an awful lot, and um, it also helps keep that that um, feeling of playing, making decisions. You know um, uh, that helps keep that in your brain because um, I think the thing that disappears the, the quickest is um, is that uh, that feeling for uh, that when you get to the game, you've got to make decisions, you've got to commit yourself, you've got to be you know you've got to believe in yourself and uh, and not spend uh, too much time doubting yourself and. Yeah. Uh, as an amateur, that's 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 the tricky part. So, I think you know, focusing on those things and uh, is you know is really the most uh, is really the most important thing. And the other thing is um, the one thing you know the only bad tournament I've really had since um, uh, since I came back playing was uh, in Vikanze. Funnily enough, I played the C group in 2012, I think, and uh, had you know a, a bad tournament. And I just realised that um, you know Vikanze is is fantastic tournament, but it's if you're playing there in in the big tournaments, then it's a real one for professionals, you know, because uh, obviously you're you're you know you're in the Dutch winter um, at a seaside resort, so it was pretty cold and pretty windy and a bit snowy as well, and uh, there's nothing else but but chess for you, you know, you've got to be a complete chess nut to be there, you know, if um, if you're going to be there for two and a half weeks, and especially when you think that after that's my holiday for the year, and then right. afterwards I go back to work, yeah. So um, I realised then that I was, you know, that um, that that was probably that was probably too serious and too professional for me and that um you know as an amateur i would play much better if i go to a place where um um where it's, it's less intensive chess where i can go to an art gallery you know and uh, before the game and just uh, see all that get in a great mood and then and then go to the game and uh and actually you know two of the best tournaments i had were barcelona and um and and oslo when i played uh, open tournaments you know that was those those were places where i could just i found some great places to go to some uh, some art galleries some some parks with uh, with sculptures and just had a lovely time before the game and in such a good mood i played really well yeah th those are great cities that that makes sense and that that's great advice and inspiring stuff um do you so a player of your of your caliber playing against uh you call it small fish i think in the book playing yeah. against stockfish on your phone how often do you like what's your expected score against it do you oh that I have to, I'd like to claim a non-disclosure agreement. On that, really. <laughs> well, I uh, mean, I think uh, I think as you allude to, uh, people people saying you're crazy for doing it. It's because they yeah. can't take the their ego well, can't uh, take I, it. I mean, I, I, I lose virtually every game. I mean, okay. uh, maybe, I, wow. maybe, maybe I make um, I make one or, or, or two draws. Uh, if I make one or two draws in ten, then I'm uh, you know I'm uh, I'm jumping up in my uh, train uh, train coupe and uh, putting my, uh, my shirt <laughs> over my head and celebrating like a football player. You know, I mean, <laughs> that's uh, great. but I get um, you know I get hammered an awful lot but um um but that's great you know i mean you're 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 uh you're learning a lesson you're stretching yourself and uh and it's also a lesson in um you know because I, I mean i go full out yeah i mean i don't play i try and play my normal game i try and calculate if it plays a move uh and i think it's wrong um then i'm going to go into the tactical line and and try and prove it and uh yeah i mean you, you learn a lot from that you really do but um but yeah i mean uh yeah you just mustn't get uh mustn't get depressed yeah i mean it's just uh it's just uh the computer you know 
the computer's not going to tell anyone, you know, it's, uh, right, and, yeah. uh, and if you make naught out of 10, just remember, you know, that I'm probably making exactly the same score. So huh. uh, don't worry. That, that's great advice. That's uh, that's inspiring stuff. OK, so last thing before I let you guys go, Natasha, besides Chess for Life and Game Changer, do you have any other favorite chess books? Oh, I, I grew up on on Bobby Fischer and my 60 memorable games. That was always my favorite as a kid. Um, and uh, I was reading. I read um, Jennifer Shahadi's book about women in chess um, recently, and um, and that was a lot of fun too. So I, I like like these days. I think I I do like the the ones with um, a bit of a human interest story as well as the chess. Or yeah. when I was a kid, I would I would play through those. You know, the do you remember the Informatus? And it, all it had was just game after game after game. And oh, I used yeah. to just play them, you know, in order from the start of the book and play through every one. <laughs> which i used to enjoy <laughs> yeah i like a little narrative with my chess book too um what about you matthew i mean as as reviewer for new in chess you see almost everything so um, it's probably a tough question but do you have a few favorites yeah i mean to be honest uh i said it a few times actually it's a real golden age for uh, for chess publishing so many fantastic books um i mean there, there's there's a great book by you know sam shankland uh, what was it small steps to giant improvement you yeah. know with uh, great fun i mean really enjoy that one i mean Gelfand as well had um, had uh, a great book on uh, um, I think it's um, what was it? It was positional chess or something like this. You know, um, there's a fantastic biography of Emmanuel Lasker that came out by um, you know looking at all details of this you know great world champion's life. Um, it was an excellent book, amazingly by not amazingly. I'm sorry, I don't mean it like that, but uh, there's a Dutch uh, international master I think called Thomas Willemser who. Uh, Wrote a sort of toolkit book for uh, for uh, for chess that was you know absolutely amazing, uh, really um, you know really nice when a, a less known a lesser known author you know uh, comes along and, and writes a book like that. Um, so I mean there is there is really you know loads and loads and loads and uh, um, yeah I mean I, you know as a reviewer I'm uh, I'm absolutely spoiled for choice I really am. Yeah, well, and and you're doing those reviews for New and Chess is is one of the many things where. I wonder how you how you find the time, especially now that it's been revealed that you you guys had this project going on as well. But but the chess world certainly appreciates it. So um, in, in closing, I don't know if I mean I know you guys are both on social media. I don't know if uh, like what your level of avail- availability for anyone who would want to reach you beyond that should they just follow you on Twitter or what would be the best way uh, for people to keep up with what you guys are up to? Yeah, we've got. Um we're both on Twitter. Uh, we've got a Facebook page about Game Changer, and we put on. So when, when we do events, then we we put those on that page. And uh, we're also doing a series of videos as well. Um, so it's a Game Changer YouTube channel. Okay, great. So. Yeah, and it's um it's all stuff that's not in the book. So it's all additional material, and um you know lots of stuff about. Open- things uh, because we we didn't want to put we didn't want to make the, the book too opening heavy so there's some chapters on the openings and the overview but lots of uh, uh well amazing little little novelties and uh and ideas that alpha zero has come up with and also some middle game themes and uh yeah i mean uh, it's all supplementary material so um it's um it's not stuff uh, you'll find in the book so uh but uh, i think you, you once you've read the book you just really you'll you'll uh, you'll, you'll uh, yeah you, you'll really enjoy watching the videos as well yeah, I, I'll definitely. I'm excited that there's going to be bonus content because the book is uh, the book only whets your appetite. So, so thanks, thanks for coming on. I know you guys have been super busy with with your lives and a lot of media hits and stuff. So, I really appreciate it. And and listeners, uh, you guys are in for a treat when when you read this book. So, I'll uh, I'll link to I'll link to where to get it in the show description as well as everything else we talked about. And uh, thank you so much, Matthew and Natasha. This was a lot of fun. Thanks thank very you. much. Yeah. Special thanks to Matthew Passy, the esteemed producer of Perpetual Chess. I also want to thank Geert Vandervelt for supplying the intro music, and thanks to everyone who helps spread the word about the show, whether it be via social media, positive reviews on podcast platforms like Apple Podcasts, or just telling a friend about the show. Every little bit helps the show grow consistently. But most of all, I want to thank people who chip in and help support the show financially. You guys have heard me say, I put a lot of time and effort into this show between researching the guests, reading the books of the guests, lining up the guests, all the promotion online. It adds up to probably about five hours a week. I love the work, but it wouldn't be possible without financial support. So... 
Thank you most of all to Chessable.com, and I want to give thanks to the following individuals and entities for their generous support. Ace Vallega, Adam Ralph of ChessEngland.com, Adam Vrancourge, Adrian Gutierrez, Alex Pejas, Benjamin Handelman, Bill Moran, Brett Howard Lynn, Brian Mullis, I am Carlos Perdomo of ChessAtlanta.com, Chad Hilton, Chad Oliver, Chris Balcom, Chris Flanagan, Chris Wainscott, Christopher Baumgartner, Christopher Shabri, Christopher Woods, I am Christoph Zalicki, a.k.a. Chess Explained, Coach J's Chess Academy, Dan O'Hanlon, Daniel Gell, Daniel Ginsberg, Daniel Lucas of U.S. Chess, Daniel Naylor, Daniel D. Schaefer, Daniel Viney, David Cramley of Chessable.com, Dwayne Edmonds, Ethan Smith, I am Elect Donnie Ariel, Frank Tortoris, Gary Andrews, Gary Lewis, Geert Vandervelt, Gerard Barta, I am Greg Shahadi, Harish Srinivasan, GM Jakob Agard of Quality Chess Publishing, James Banastia, James Millick, Jason Woolham, Jeff Anderson, Jennifer Valens of OffTheRook.com, Jeffrey Martello, John Fernandez, John Fontaine, John Hartman, John Jernigan, WGM Jen Shahadi, Jens Green, Jerry Wells, John Thompson, WGM Katarina Nemsova, Kelly Palmer, I am Kostya Kovutsky, Krishna Gopala Krishnan, Laura Belyavsky, Lorraine Dore, Lucio Casada Silva, Matthew Passi, Martin Habish, Matthew Tedesco, my main man, Moonmaster9000, Nate Sotlin, Nathan Webster, GM Pascal Charbonneau, Passi Passanen, Paul Clarkson, Paul Sweeney, Paolo Santana, Peter Lux, Peter Merrifield, Randy Temple, Ricky Grijalva, Rob Lazorchek of DiplomatChess.com, Robert Steiner, Ryan Berg, Ryan Stone, Scott Darty, Scott McKinnon, Steiner Lima, the law office of Stuart Katz, in case any of y'all are in legal trouble, uh, WGM Tatya Vabrahamian, Thomas Casper, Thomas Stanix, Thomas Tachenko, Tim Brennan of TacticsTime.com, Tim Seymour, Timothy Ha, Todd Bryant, Tony Rotella, Tyron Price, Victor Vrancouz, FM Zhao Chang of Chess1000.com, and the last person in the alphabet, Zhivko Stoyanov. Thanks, everyone. I will catch you all next week.